as hummingbirds, we don't, which is quite normal for this time of the year. You know, they arrive here in May, they feed like crazy, and then they disappear for their breeding season. Anyway, last year I had to do some research about hummingbirds and hummingbird nectar, and I learned a few things that I wanted to share it with you. First of all, you don't have to boil water when you make your own hummingbird nectar. It doesn't really slow down bacteria. Keeping your nectar in the fridge to slow down that bacteria also doesn't really work. And on top of that, hummingbirds absolutely do not like drinking cold nectar because they have to warm it up and that means it burns more of their energy and you know, they're just not gonna do that. And right now, since there are no hummingbirds around, it's kind of normal to forget your, you know, old nectar in the hummingbird feed and then it spoils and goes bad. So this is where this product comes in really handy. Actually, the inventor of this Feed Fresh uh, Nectar Defender, Dennis Jenkins, um, helped me with my research and I was hoping he would be on this episode, but he's away. So we'll be, we'll invite him uh, next episode. So let me tell you what it does. This thing extends the life of your hummingbird nectar. So what I do now is I just take warm water. I mix it with sugar, you know, the proportion one part sugar, four parts water. Then I add the nectar defender. I pour it in my hummingbird feeders and here in our climate that can last for up to two weeks. So right now I don't actually have to worry about uh, changing it that frequently. So here in Canada, I bought this online from a Wild Birds Unlimited store. It's not as available here in Canada. In the US, you can find it in more places like Amazon and also Wild Birds Unlimited stores. So more on the next episode. Camille Chiraldi is a raptor monitor for Colorado State Parks. She and her colleagues uh, were watching a golden eagle nest and then one day a juvenile from the previous year started dropping food into the nest. They've never witnessed a behavior like this so they're just curious to learn what's going on. Hi Camille. As a lover of birds of prey for my entire life, I was quite intrigued by your observation of that juvenile golden eagle dropping food to a rock ledge where a pair of golden eagles sat on a clutch of eggs. Usually when a juvenile bird sticks around to assist an adult pair of birds with the raising of a new brood, whether it's raptors, woodpeckers, crows, or some other species, we refer to that behavior as helping. It's frequently a youngster from the previous year's breeding to play this role. There are various hypotheses out there to explain why a juvenile bird might engage in this behavior, and here are two leading explanations. Some claim that the helper is hoping to become an actual breeder at that nest should one of the adult birds die or not show up in a subsequent year. It doesn't matter if they're genetically related either. Others say that the helper does it to gain experience as a parent. Now the question is, has this behavior been recorded before with golden eagles? So I reached out to several of my colleagues whom I know have spent many years studying this species to see what they thought. Mike Cokert, who's had extensive experience with golden eagles and who's a co-author of the species account of the Birds of the World series managed by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, told me that trios of golden eagles attending a nest have been recorded on rare occasions, but it was not confirmed that one of the eagles was a juvenile from a previous nesting. Dave Haynes informed me that he's seen juvenile golden eagles help with nest building early in the breeding season in California, and Daniel Driscoll said that he's seen juvenile golden eagles, both male and female, helping at nests in Arizona and California. But neither could confirm that they were youngsters from a previous nesting by the adult pair because the birds were not marked in any way to confirm their origin. Since you sound adamant, Camille, that your juvenile was indeed from a previous nesting by that pair it was helping, this sounds like a first reporting of this behavior and as such should be published in a scientific journal. So last environment is we talked about no more May and we actually do enjoy it because it helps our lawn get green and nice and lush after a long winter. And it also helps us identify some of the things that we're not going to cut down, like this milkweed plant that is growing right in the middle of our lawn. So we put a little thing around it and we are preventing, you know, the dog and our kids from trampling over it and soon it's gonna be blooming. But uh, we did receive a few comments uh, that dandelions don't actually work for everyone and we totally agree with that because dandelions are not native here and they can choke a lot of uh, beneficial 
native plants. So the best thing to do for that no more May is to buy native wildflowers to your area and have a patch on your lawn dedicated to just that and not to cut that area. If you're not sure which plants are native to your area, uh, if you're in the US, you can just Google uh, Native Plant Society and each state has its own so you can get in touch with them and they'll tell you what's native to your region. And here in Canada, there's actually this cool uh, website that has an interactive map where you can find native nurseries in your area. It's called canplant.ca. Check it out. Just about anywhere in the world, say for South America and Antarctica, one can find big black birds, whether they be crows or ravens or both. Moreover, one can see them in a wide range of habitats, ranging from the deserts of Baja, Mexico, to the vast boreal forest and tundra of Canada, to the concrete canyons of New York City. Interestingly, the expansion of the populations of crows and ravens is much greater than the other members of the corvid family, namely the jays and magpies. And why is that? A recently published study hypothesized that a combination of three traits, i.e. body size, wing length and brain size, allowed crows and ravens to colonize and diversify across the world. By examining corvid specimens from museums around Europe and the US, the study found that the corvus genus, that is the crows and ravens, consistently had bigger body size, longer wings, and larger relative brain sizes than the rest of their corvid cousins. The longer wings allow these large birds to fly further in the first place, and when they get to where they're going, they use their larger body size and bigger brains to establish their dominance in whatever landscape they emigrate to. In other words, it's one thing for birds to reach new places, but they need to have a strong ability to survive once they get there. Crows and ravens were able to diversify quickly and widely because they were particularly good at coping with different habitats. The larger brains provide these birds with the ability to adopt new behaviors in new environments, which in turn allow them to survive the initial period of poor adaptation long enough to allow natural selection to catch up and produce a range of new species in the process. Because the more mobile crows and ravens were able to colonize so many dramatically different new environments, they got exposed to many more selection pressures than their smaller corvid counterparts. And that's why we see big black birds just about everywhere we go. We love owls and we've been hoping to attract one to our backyard. Remember last year we installed an owl box. Well, there's been just squirrels using them this year, which is actually normal. So not all hope is lost. Anyway, Gloria Pauluk from Saskatchewan sent us pictures of a long-eared owl that's been hanging out in her pine tree sort of on and off for the past seven years. Gloria also sees great horned owls in her backyard and she says that comparing to the great horned, long-eared owls are very shy and very skittish. Long-eared owls live pretty much everywhere in North America and in many parts of Eurasia and they have been spotted in some areas in North and East Africa. Females are slightly larger than males and they have more of this dark brown plumage. You can identify these owls by their long ear tufts and the presence of this rather orangish plumage all over their body. Eurasian species are much paler than the North American ones. During the non-breeding season, long-eared owls tend to roost together up to 20 birds in some areas. Imagine walking into that roost and then they are very vocal during their breeding season and very quiet uh, for the rest of the year.
Long-eared owls love to nest in dense vegetation that borders some kind of an open area because this is where they hunt during the night. They use their ears to detect their prey. Their diet is primarily small mammals, you know, moles and voles and rats and mice, but sometimes they might snatch up a roosting bird, though that diet is more common in the old world than here in North America. So basically, they are your best rodent control. They're not very territorial, only when something or somebody approaches their nest and unfortunately they fall prey to other birds of prey like barn owls and gray horned owls and red-shouldered hawks and even raccoons. Long-eared owls do not build their own nests but prefer to reuse other birds' nests, like the ones that were built by ravens and magpies, they normally have one brood per season. They nest from March to May. They lay about four to six eggs. Males feed incubating females. And when the chicks hatch, males tend to bring and stockpile a whole bunch of food sort of on the edge of the nest. And then females take that food and they kind of rip it apart and they feed smaller pieces uh, to the chicks. I found some pictures that were quite graphic. Babies fledge when they're about 20 21 days old but they're completely flightless so they tend to hang out on adjacent to the nest branches and daddies feed them until they learn how to fly all right it's time to wrap up i've got some gardening to do enjoy your week our photo contest is still open it's reflections take care everyone i'll catch you in two weeks